You guys love our tier lists and we've recently covered a bit of scope creep and how do you prevent scope creep. And recording that video, I thought about actually scope creep isn't just adding more mechanics to your game. It isn't just like expanding the story or having more playable characters or whatever. It's actually also things like having different kinds of graphic settings or having rebindable controls or whatever. Things that you feel like are standard in like AAA games because they have all the budget for scope creep basically, but that you don't always need to have in your indie game. So I brought Thomas along with me here. We made a bunch of different like basic features or like common features that you may see in games. And we're going to be tier listing them in terms of, okay, this one you should really have. That's what's an S tier list. Like it's really worth it to spend the development time on localization or whatever, versus these are some things that honestly don't bother with for your game. It's not gonna add a lot of value or like not compared to the weeks of bonus development time that it's going to add. Also, before you get your pitchforks out, Jesus guys, these are our opinions. <laughs> well, you can still have wrong opinions. I guess if you're you. <laughs> so let's start with localization. This is one that B tier we have learned a lot about. So with Forge Industry, we implemented localization ourselves, which would you say that was a worthwhile investment? No. I, th there are a couple of things wrong with it. First of all, you wanted to do way too much languages. Second of all, that is a it's a whole lot of text you have to translate. You have to be consistent in your like terminology or you will confuse native speakers. And it was also wrong for uh, from us to create the system ourselves, basically. You can yeah. get like a great asset. I do localize for like 15 bucks or so in sale. Like, yeah. what are you doing? So <laughs> Songs of Evergate, we're localizing as well but we're using that i2 localize, which means that you just have like a Google Drive sheet where you put in all of your localizations, your translations, and they just go into the game. It deals with stuff like changing your fonts automatically, right to left or left to right if you're doing like Arabic. So that makes it a lot easier there, but there's still a lot of issues with localization. I think, first of all, knowing the languages is gonna be a big one because yeah, sure, like there's a big Chinese audience and a big Korean audience and a big Japanese audience, but one, do you know those languages? Most likely not, unless if you're like the most like talented polyglot. But second of all, it's like, do you have the budget or like the know-how to actually do those localizations? Because there is definitely a cost. I think some quotes we got is about $30 for 1000 words or 100 words, one of the two, I'll put it on the screen of some of the, the numbers we had, which generally like Forge Industry was 10,000 plus words, which isn't yeah. really like that easy to localize. There is definitely a marketing advantage to yeah. localizing. But before we continue, there's also another downside, which we noticed with Forge Industry, is not all our languages are just as long. Yeah, you have I long uh, languages and short languages. And we basically solve this by saying, hey, we just auto scale our font but I think Mari still has nightmares because it looks ugly. Yeah, and I think in Songs of Evergate, what we did there is we decided on four languages we want to localize. English, Dutch, because we know Dutch, Chinese, because we know someone who speaks. Like let me, week. let me, I just, I was getting there. <laughs> the reason, so we had four languages, Dutch, English, Chinese, and Japanese. And last week we were doing, we were getting ready for our demo. So we were updating our localizations and I realized that Dutch and German has this problem even more, is a long ass language, which meant that a lot of things that would fit in English and also yeah, fit in Chinese and Japanese because they're symbol based. So like the text is much shorter in length than English, just wouldn't fit in the same UI elements if we were doing it in Dutch. And we had two options. We could go and rework all of our UI to support longer text, or we could just scrap Dutch. We scrapped the Dutch, like ga aan Nederlanders. But this is something that you need to keep in mind that, hey, it's not just about getting the words, but it's also getting the stuff well in your game. Like there is a thing called localization QA that does matter. Also things like, hey, you can't just Google Translate because some things may be depending on cultural context. So honestly, I think you said like whatever B tier or something, I would even go for C tier. I can live with that. Beat your, was me being generous yeah. because I think it does add value to your game. But don't do it much. for like your first yeah. game and everything. Like sure, we did get- You have different priorities. Yeah, we translated Forge Industry to Danish and Danish definitely has more of an audience, but I don't know if it's that worth it really to have Danish, for example. And the only people that play basically in Dutch are like parents that buy it for their children because our Forge Industry looks like Minecraft. 
Next up is controller support. I'm so biased on this. <laughs> I think this just heavily depends on what game you're making. Are you making like a shooter game? I would say controller support is like S tier, you need to have it. If you're making like a very UI heavy game, like Forge in the Street. Shooter game, really? I would have expected like a fighting game. Yeah, or like a fighting game S tier as well. Yeah. Whereas if you're making something like Forge Industry, we didn't even bother yeah. trying to get control support because all of that menu navigation is really hard. Like a controller isn't really made for it. I know Factorial like got support for controllers at some point, but I don't even want to begin thinking about how much pain that was to get implemented. I think this is actually a pretty good thing if you can do it for the, uh, the genre you have, because yeah. for example, it's a lot easier to transition to things like a Steam Deck and RG Ally, things like that, because they are basically fully controlled. Yeah, and like, even if you're yeah. making like a PC game, a lot of people still like to play with a controller because then they can like lean back a little bit and just chill whilst they're playing their game. I think this is a big value add, but because it is not applicable to every genre, we can't rank it super high. So no S tier. I would do a B tier. I want to go A tier. We'll do both. We'll do like our middle. Oh uh, yes, of course, because we have never been roasted for that before. <laughs> oh, that's not my problem. And then speaking of controller, the next thing is rebinding your controls. This is one that the PC gamer in me for Forge Industry especially was like, we need to have controller rebinds and we do have them and it's good, but it has cost us a lot of development time. We first started off with Rewired, then we went to the Unity's new input system and we had to like make the UI ourselves. There were some issues with settings not being persisted correctly. So for Songs of Averages right now, there is no controller rebinding or like no control rebinding, whether your PC and or your controller you're stuck to whatever we've given you. And it has made our life much more easy, but I'm not really certain if it's like the best thing. I think for certain games, you can't get around not having rebindable controllers, but I think it is something that honestly, I don't think you need in your first game. I agree. If you have to pick between this and control support, I would pick control support nine, out of, nine times out of 10, unless I make something like a Forge Industry. But what would you do about the people who play Azerty or like, another weird keyboard. Yeah, that's that's the, the big problem, like if you have uh... Yeah, we have here in Belgium, we don't use QWERTY by default, we use Azerty. And growing up, there were a lot of games that didn't support rebinding. Honestly, if you're one of those kids from one of those countries, you're just used to having an English language like switch in uh, Windows as well, just to play with WASD very easily. So I think if you're definitely looking for a value add and you're going to spend the extra time, go with the controller support instead of controls. Controls are still really good. I think I would put controls on a B tier. I would put it just a, a, a tiny, tiny bit higher than localization. A tiny, tiny bit higher. Okay, I can do that as well. Like they are definitely something, especially if you're making a PC game, you are going to get some backlash if you don't have it, but it is going to probably add at least like, I would say like a week of development time in like testing it and implementing it. Like Unity's new input system is pretty good. You can get started with it very easily, but then adding it into your game, having that cohesive UI, having that safe load for it as well. Yeah, your hints that should update when the player changes their buttons, all yeah. those things. Those things matter. All right, next up is graphic settings. You know, the things that uh, most gamers go to press ultra, then realize their PC can't handle it and put it to very low instead. Yeah, so basically this just means you go to the options, you can get presets, change things like your shadow quality, how far your draw distance is, all those things. One other big important thing that may actually be more important than like ultra quality and low quality is things like motion blur, V-Sync, oh. full screen versus windowed, being able to select the monitor you play on. I think those you almost need. If you have like a game that has like motion, like we were recently trying out Dead Island and it had so bad motion blur that like you just like got a headache from playing that game and there is no setting for it. I play VR games that make me less motion sick than Dead Island. Like what the hell guys? Yeah, so a lot of people like I, like vSync. A lot of people I know hate vSync as well. And like things like that, there is a lot of individual preference. And one of that is one of the things where like motion blur, field of view, field of view, especially if you like make shooter or first person games, if you have a low field of view that is locked and you can't change, I am not playing your game. Easy as that. So instead of focusing purely on the graphical fidelity, I think you should at least have those common things like vSync, motion blur, Feel a few depending on your genre, just like the more common visual things that enhance the experience. 
This is more of a technical topic. I have less to say here. You actually implemented the Forge Industry graphic options. Forge Industry graphic options actually don't do that much in my opinion. Yeah, it's mainly shadows, I feel. Yeah, it's mainly shadows and Forge Industry is mainly a CPU bounded game anyway. So for Forge Industry, it isn't really applicable. It, it, it really depends on the genre. If you make a pixel art game, don't bother. If you make a high fidelity game, you probably should bother because otherwise people with lower end PCs, their games would crash. Is this completely required? I'm not entirely on that side of the camp. If you have something with more graphical, I think you should have it. It's going to be, it's going to cost you extra time, but I think it's one of those things that you should still yeah, if you don't do it, they, they start the game, see it's laggy and refund. Yeah, this is like shout out to all my Unreal devs who have like a like low poly game that somehow like me, my PC still starts like burning up even though it's relatively powerful. So Unity over Unreal, is that what you're saying? Oh. Go watch the tier list. <laughs> A tier? Yeah, I think this is so far the best thing we've covered at least. Because if you do this wrong, your player can't play the game. Next up is a new game plus. This is, if you don't know what it is, it's basically if you have a game like a platformer, for example, or it doesn't have to be a platformer, you finish the game once, then you get the option to unlock new game plus, which is basically story-wise the same game, but it's a lot more hardcore already. Like you have a lot more enemies, you get like certain weapons and stuff earlier in the game already. So it's more of a challenging version of your game. Like how would you do this as a developer basically means like when you design your levels and you have like spawn points or whatever, you make like spawn points for regular game and for new game plus at the same time. So development wise, it isn't always the hardest I think, but on the other side, I think it's not that required really. I, I don't think it's worth it at all. If you have a, if you are an indie game and you make a story game, which is mostly when this comes into play, in my opinion, mm -hmm. then if your game is already too short that you need a game, new game plus, make your game longer or sell it for cheaper. Basically think I need this for more content, yeah, this is not what I, I would like. I would just spend the time creating new game plus to add more content in general. Yeah, D tier yeah. or E tier? Let's put it D because there is, there's still, yeah. as always, a value add, but... Yeah, there are still like definitely people who do like new game plus as well. Yeah, and some genres, it's almost a staple. So sometimes you can't really avoid it if you want to be like competitive in the genre, but in general, most genres, I wouldn't bother. Next up, we have anti-cheat, and this is like, these are kind of two versions of anti-cheat. First of all, you have the one of like multiplayer games where you just can't like memory change how much ammo you have and like you have a minigun basically. And then the second like version of anti-cheat is as well, like this is something that you guys sometimes ask me. It's like, I'm making a single player game. Don't bother. And I don't want people to like change the save files or whatever. In that case, it's an F tier. Like don't bother with, if you have a single player game to like prevent anyone from changing the game, like save files or whatever. Maybe don't make it too easy for them, but also don't add unnecessary complexity. They bought the game. If they feel like they wanted to cheat, so be it. I think it's not going to be yeah. worth for you to like, obfuscate save files or whatever and like do stuff like that there's much more important things such as actually making a good game that you should be spending on if you're making a multiplayer game with any kind of leaderboard yeah it's basically s tier for multiplayer f tier for single player i would put this as an s tier in terms of you need this but i think go with an asset don't try to engineer this yourself this is like you're not a security guy and even if you are you shouldn't become a game security guy yeah. There are still like anti-cheat assets out there. Just go with those. Yeah, so S tier for multiplayer, F tier for single. Player. Yeah, but I'm just gonna put it in S tier because honestly, you can't ignore it if you are making a multiplayer game. Yeah, next up. Achievements. I think honestly, this is pretty self-explanatory what it is. If you haven't heard about achievements and are making a game, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, I think achievements, they're an easy win. They don't take that much time. Just don't go overboard with it, but I would have some achievements. It's always nice for your players to have it. So this is definitely something that I would put as an S tier, easy. Does Songs of Everjade have achievements? Not yet, but it's something that we can add in like, we, we already have support for it basically. We just haven't decided what is going to like testify yeah. as you unlock an achievement. But development wise, it doesn't take that long. It's always nice to have achievements. It's not gonna make it so people are going to buy your game more, Definitely, but it is one of those things that you should have. Yeah, it also sometimes keeps people playing for longer because they want that XP and such like things like that. Yeah. Some people are completionists, so yeah. if you can please them in a very 
low effort way, why not? Next up, we get tutorials. And this is a, oh. we, we have a complicated history with tutorials, I guess. We've always had them, ish. They haven't been good though. I think you should have tutorials. The issue is making them good is hard. And it's at a certain point, it may be easier to just not have a tutorial if you're making a game that isn't like too mechanically in-depth than having a bad one that like railroads you and you first need to do a tutorial before you can go to the main menu screen. Don't do that. I will find you and murder you. Fight Me Games does not condone his behavior. <laughs> But uh, tutorials, they are something that is like, there are people who need tutorials, definitely. But they do take some time to get done well and to just get implemented to begin with. So it's a bit of a hard one. You need them, but they do add a lot of development time if you're making a longer game. And in my opinion, they are also very genre specific. For example, a Forge Industry without a tutorial will be Useless. horrible. But if you make a platformer game, you might not just need a tutorial because... Unless you have like some specific stuff. mechanic, like, yeah. oh, there's this special gun that is a grappling hook and yeah. I don't know what. So it's also a bit genre specific, as most things are, but... B tier? Yeah, mm, yeah, I, yeah it's, it's still better than localization. I yeah, definitely. Go for a, a tutorial still. Next up, I, I guess I'll cover this one yeah. because you're not a code guru. Uh, so basically unit tests or play more tests, depending on the, yeah. Basically having a way to test your game in a Automatic. not need to like boot up the game. Yeah. So just press a button, run automatic tests, see if everything's working. For since we had quite a bit of tests, but mostly were auto-generated with our items. So that's already a okay use case. Songs of Evergate has zero tests. Why? Well, it's harder to test because there are a lot more variables. But now we're working on our, are we? Yeah, you can say it. Okay, I can say it. We're all already working on our third game, Guild Architect. And that's basically also a very management and simulation game heavy game where, yeah, things are basically set in stone, where things are a lot more robust systems. They are operating inter like, together. Those things are much easier to test, depending on the genre as always. But that's easy to test. Are they worth it, what you yes. say? Yes, I wouldn't. I, I would. <laughs> you never, yeah, that's true. You are a very lazy programmer. Yeah. So the fact that he makes it probably means that it's a good thing. I can tell you that much. The reason we didn't vote for Stones of Airjet, for example, is you could t uh, test things like, hey, if I get hit, do I take damage? And that's also a good test, I guess. But there were definitely uh, things we could test with Songs of Virgate. Or like, yeah. I take an item, do the stat changes get applied correctly? Yeah. I, at one point we wanted to do it. So there's still a to-do add test, <laughs> I think, in that class. But some genres, I would like lean a lot more creating them than with others. If you make a simulation or a management game, I would probably put it at How much time would you say it costs? Uh, it's quite a bit of time, though. So if you're a solo developer, it's already harder to justify. That's a good point. But on the other hand, if you make a shit game. Yeah. A tier? <laughs> No, not A tier. Okay. No. B, C? I, I would put it at C. It's good, but I, you can still make a decent game without it. And depending on the genre, honestly, I don't think it's like needed that much. Speaking of not needed that much, uh, community like workshop support. So S -tier. basically modding support. If I listen to the comments you guys make, it's, it sounds like it's an S tier because you're like, oh, you should have added modding support to Forge Industry. It would have really vitalized the game. And there guess would be what? A, <laughs> guess what? We have modding support, but if your game just isn't good enough to begin with, like, or there's not enough critical mods to begin with, yeah. no one's gonna bother with it. And it has cost us a lot of extra development time to yeah. get mods in there. We, we, we really went quite a bit overboard. You can do a lot with uh, the modding support we added. And all of you guys saying this is the same as me like a year ago, which is like a massive amount of hopium, hoping like- He oh, was always like, oh, we have mod support. If it's we do that, awesome. oh, it's going to be great. Community will carry the game. Um, if your community is like- 10 so, people. Yeah, if you parents. sell a thousand copies, still no one will make mods. You need a lot more mass than that. If you think you, your game can sell easily over a thousand copies, either you are pretty good for your first game or you're just not realistic. And think about things as well, like documenting the modding, yeah. like toolkits as well. It's a lot of extra work that most of the time won't really pay off. So sure, some games such as like Minecraft and like the Elder Scrolls games and whatever, they really flourish on mods, but those are like some design decisions taken from day one, for example, with like Java and Minecraft that yeah. make it easier. But if you have a Unity game and you're just wanna like tech on mods, like halfway through your development cycle, it's doomed. 
that's what we basically try to do. Yeah, and also just they have a, like Minecraft and the Elder Scrolls, for example, Skyrim. They are like million sellers. You won't sell a million copies. If you do, you have to go to our Patreon and basically support us. I mean, that's basically a given. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would put this at E or F tier. E tier, I think. Definitely, there are still some games yeah. that can benefit from mods, but uh, most won't. Yeah, most won't. If you do want to have mod support, basically make your game so that all of the things that you program as the developer are already mods, basically. Yeah. That's the only one like approach you should do in that regard. Next up, we have, should you have a demo? Because demos, they do yes. take a little bit of extra time to make. Like you need to gate off maybe certain parts of your game. You need to have a little bit of extra pop-ups or whatever. Like, hey, this is the demo, go and wishlist the game, go and buy the game, whatever. But like you said, yes. This is the biggest S tier you could have. This could be like triple S, whatever you want to call it. This is the life hack to game development in 2024. This allows you to market much more successfully. Like having a Steam page up is one thing, having it up early, but until you have a demo on the Steam page, your wish lists aren't going to be that crazy. But having a demo out there that already showcases some part of your game, like a like even can just be like a five to 10 minute example already of this is what the game is going to be, is going to do a lot more in terms of converting people because they can actually try out if the game is fun for them. And alongside that, you can participate in Steam Next Fest, which is a massive boost in visibility. Like I said, I think this is the biggest, biggest S tier you could have. Like on any tier list we've done, this is by far the biggest S tier. Yeah, so this is the... S tier of S tier. No, but you don't, you don't have to put it higher or first, no? Yeah, but then it goes out of frame. But then put it first. <sighs> no, we'll <laughs> deal with it in post. Next up, we have multiplayer. So this is something that I do the, the Patreon coaching. A lot of people, they come to me with their game design documents and they're like, I'm gonna make a five person multiplayer strategy game. And I'm like, hold on your horses, there, cowboy. Like, are you sure you wanna do that? And they're like, actually, no, I don't think I wanna do that. Once I like talk about how are you gonna handle networking? And especially, this is like, you're gonna roast me in the comments, but if you're making a Godot game, don't bother with networking because there is simply not enough of like a robust architecture for it yet. If you go to Unity or Unreal, there's plenty of assets out there that handle most of the stuff already for you. Whereas I was talking to a guy who had spent like half a year already implementing his own FPS networking code in Godot. It's like, are you making a game or are you making a library at that point? That was my tangent. Multiplayer takes a lot of extra work. Also keep in mind, are you doing peer-to-peer -peer networking, which has some security concerns, or are you doing client server, which has a bonus cost because you're going to need to be hosting servers most of the time, or at least offer an option to host them like yourself, the servers, and then you still need to have like discovery and whatever. If you go networking, I would use the Steam networking layer. If you're a solo developer, don't do multiplayer. First of all, how are you going to test it? You're gonna have two computer, like two Unities open at the same time. And you yeah, but how are you gonna test latency if I punch you and you punch me? <laughs> yeah, that's where unit tests come in. Whatever. If this is your first game, this is the biggest F tier of your life. Don't do it. You will make, this is not a good idea. If you are already more experienced, it can be better, but I still wouldn't rank it too highly. I think if you have made like two games or something already, you yeah. can try multiplayer. We're reaching a point where we are like pretty I want to make now. one. Okay, we'll see Not about yet, that. But, but we have an understanding already of how does Unity work, how does game design work before we stack on like real-time networking or whatever on top of that. Also really depending on your genre, if you're making a party game, I mean, you need networking. If, who plays a party game on their own? <laughs> see? Yeah, it's like, put it in the middle because it's, it's like one of these things like sometimes you need. Sometimes you don't. Most of the times you don't. Next up is branching narratives. So this is, first of all, you're making a story-based game, which can be really good. Like not everyone has to be a hardcore programmer. Maybe you just have a really good story you want to share. And then what you can do on top of that is, okay, instead of having a single pod that you can take, the player can actually branch throughout the game, like they can choose which princess to marry or whatever if they're doing a visual novel, or they can choose how they influence the story. It can be really cool in terms of narrative-based games. The issue is this is a massive, massive piece of scope creep because suddenly you're not just writing multiple stories, you're also having to deal with the tracking of what did the character like decide to do 10 like hours ago? Did he like bribe the guard or did he pay his fine or whatever? 
suddenly that's going to come back probably and actually matter. You don't want to do a Mass Effect tree where in the end none of your decisions truly matter and like you just had some choices without any purpose. It's a lot of extra time and if you're not a narrative designer first, I think you shouldn't bother with it. If you really are making a game where the story is the thing you're focusing on, first of all, you don't even need to have branching stories to have a good story, but then you can definitely try it out. But otherwise, I would stay far away from it. I would only do it as if I were making a visual novel, basically. Otherwise, it's, it's such a big amount of scope creep. If you're one of the guys, like some people here in the room might be, that want to make an RPG with branching storyline and all those things, like you remember PCC? Yeah, definitely. You will learn very quickly that you are tackling way too big of a, a beast that you can't do this on your own. You need a, a big team. There's a reason why Baldur's Gates took seven years with like 200 people. How are you going to do it solo? If you can, if you, if you, I can answer the question, give me a good explanation and how you will achieve it and achieve this, I will have respect for you at least. But is this our F tier? Yeah, this is probably, unless you're making a visual novel it's probably F tier in my opinion. Because even even games that implement browsing story, it's often such shit writing, let's be honest. Yeah, or it's like, does this really change add, the game? Does yeah. this really add, like, maybe it's better to just have one really focused, really dialed in story versus having like multiple, like, eh, kind of stories. Yeah. The proof of, for example, linear stories being good, and then we'll move on, I swear, is for example, things like The Last of Us or Firewatch or like most uh, Naughty Dog games. Yeah. Next up, because I make these tier lists, so I get to do whatever <laughs> the hell I want and no one can stop me, is Trains. F tier, there's a reason we didn't add it to uh, Forge Industry, Martin. So Trains, I believe, fit in almost any genre and they can be a really good value add for your game. I would say Trains are even better than Fishing. Like, Fishing is one of those things you can put into almost any game and it will like, increase the score on Metacritic by like 10 points. Yeah, there are no bad games that have phishing implemented. Someone once commented it and I was like, that's a stupid statement. And I looked it up and I'm like, he might be onto something. Yeah, and it's a similar thing no, with trains. Trains are completely different. Trains offer such a, like you can take any boring game and add trains to it and it's successful. My proof, games like Choo Choo Charles, like, it's a regular horror game so, where you're so, being... So you're saying if we did commit to adding trains to Forge Industry... It would be better. We would have sold so much more. The reason Forge Industry is currently sitting at like 640 copies sold is because you didn't allow me to give the freedom to add trains because it would have allowed me to express like more of a... This like trains are very visual. Like you can have a little smoke puffs coming out. They're great in marketing. <laughs> also, it would have been able to add extra mechanics to our game, such as a transporting. There are mechanics you can put inside of your game. I can guarantee you with trains, no matter what kind of game you're making, you can find a way to put trains in it. And it's going Dating to- Dating sim, you're going to date a train. You can make like, <laughs> first of all, yes, you can date a train probably. That is- I don't want to know how you do Second that. of all, you could have like, it could be part of your environment. There could be a stage that takes place on a train. I like prepared for this. I'm just like, this is maybe not the most- I, why do I have to like <laughs> undergo all of this? I think trains are really solid. Also, look at how many people are like interested in train sims. That's like free marketing. Like make a little train simulator. I don't know. And also like you can make some cool storylines about trains. Like there's plenty of things you can do with trains. Like I said, F tier, let's move on. <laughs> S tier. F tier. Uh, you, you wanna- don't, oh. don't take this one too serious, but if you can make a game <laughs> with trains in it, like, please do so and like send me the link and I will like play your game. I will give you free marketing or something. I don't know. Trains are S tier in my opinion. One day we'll make a train game where you can fuck a train or something, but today is not that day, unfortunately. I'm happy that today is not that day. And last but maybe least, Choo -choo. we will find out once we decided to score is difficulty selection. We basically mean like the easy, normal, hard thing. You press the, the beginning of a game or sometimes in the middle of a game. Are we also going to dynamic difficulty settings or just the settings? Just to the basic ones of easy, medium, hard and like okay. ultra nightmare or whatever. I think this question is like that little dialogue you ask at the beginning is such a weird thing to ask because the player has never played the game before perhaps. 
and you ask him, how good are you at this game? Well, maybe they're asking, are you a video games journalist or do you actually play games? That's like what the dialogue should say. Yeah, but for example, if I were playing something like an RPG, I would probably play it on hard. If I were playing a shooter, I'd probably put it on easy because I'm really, really bad at shooters. Yeah, and you know that. Like, I would play on like ultra realism, ultra nightmare mode for a shooter because I know like I'm good at shooters. That's not from what I remember from when we played Val Valorant. Yeah. Valorant isn't a good shooter. I'm talking about like stuff like Doom Eternal. <laughs> I have played multiple times on ultra nightmare. Oh well, I do think this adds value. It's also important, uh, in my opinion, where you make your game accessible to a lot of people. That's also one of the reasons why, for example, Forge Industry had difficulty settings, for example. But for Forge Industry, it was a weird one. Yeah, but it was still there. We were still, still like, there. let's yeah. do it. In general, things that improve the accessibility can never be rated too low. For example, that's also why, for example, rebindable controls is, in my opinion, okay, because, for example, people with a handicap or use different controls can easily rebind it to whatever they need. But this thing is like... Uh, uh, how much would you think? The issue is, what does it cost you in terms of extra development? It depends how you implement it. If you do, just do a stat chain, so like we did in Forge Industry, it's Not, very easy. Yeah. Then it's a pretty nice add. Yeah, you, you like take easier. all of your enemies' HP and you do like times 0 0.75 and you like yeah. increase your damage of the main character. Which is how most games do it. But if you do things like sc scaling drops, for example, uh, also like the amount of en enemies that spawn or games that yeah. do that, then it's already like the impact is a bit higher. I think it's a solid thing. I would rate it decently, perhaps like C B tier. B tier, definitely. I think you should go for difficulties. Difficulty settings are still a really good thing to have in your game and don't overcomplicate it. Just do the like multiply like the stats to like you do more damage or you like take less damage or whatever. Don't overcomplicate it, but it is going to be much easier or like it's going to be much more approachable for players to play your game because if you have a demo of a game and like the demo has no difficulty setting and it's just like you immediately get destroyed and you can't even make the game easier so to say well you're not going to be converting as much like unless you're making a roguelike yeah in roguelikes then then having a difficulty setting is less of a thing but in most genres in general have those difficulty settings those are definitely some of those things that isn't too like demanding yeah i can live with uh, most of those statements so that concludes this tier list yeah. how many clown takes did we take like take a shot for every clown take we had in this uh, tier list i guess and soon we will make the tier list of our tier list <laughs> or we tier list our tier list yeah so we still have a few maybe to go before we reach that point but i hope this has explained a little bit more what did we miss i think we got some of the core parts already let us know in the comments down below also let us know which is like do you think that branching narrative should be an s tier have you gotten any personal experience with that let us know it really helps us out in like learning more about game development as well because we understand you're players as well, not just game developers, so you still have some valid opinions. And if you want to harass Marnix even more personally, you can always join our Discord server and message him so he knows that he did a clown take. Anyways, that's all we had to say. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye.